In this video, we're going to begin chapter four, section two, classifying chemical reactions. But as you'll find out, this is actually a huge subchapter. So we're gonna split it into two videos. And so this is part one of two, okay? building on the first video where we learned how to balance chemical reactions. Now we're gonna see how to classify them. And throughout 4.2, we're gonna get three major ways to classify a chemical reaction. These are the three most common types of reactions, but far from a comprehensive list of all of the types of chemical reactions. Okay, so what's the first one we're looking at? A precipitation reaction. Okay. And a precipitation reaction is where you have dissolved substances, okay, so two or more dissolved substances that combine and react to form one or more solid products. So you may have learned this in the past as a double displacement, a double replacement, or a metathesis. Here we're calling it a precipitation reaction because it involves the formation of a solid precipitate. Yep. And most of these types of reactions have the exchange of ions between ionic compounds in an aqueous solution. So that's kind of a quick trick to identify a precipitation reaction. If you have aqueous ionic reactants, and a solid product, chances are it's a precipitation reaction. These are common in nature and in chemical industry. But what we also need to be able to do is look at the ions that are present in solution and determine if they'll combine to make a solid. And that has to do with the rules of solubility. Yep. What is solubility? The maximum concentration of a substance that can be achieved under specified conditions. Right? So basically, how much can you put into a solution at a specific pressure and temperature? Okay? Because we all know that salt, for example, is soluble in water, right? Salt dissolves in water. But that's not to say I can dump an infinite amount of salt in water and it'll always continue to dissolve. Everything has a solubility limit. Okay? Some have a solubility limit that's very high. They have large solubility. We're considering them to just be soluble. Okay. But if the conditions are so that the concentration has exceeded the solubility, then it starts to precipitate out, forms a solid in solution. Okay. So if something has a low solubility and we call it insoluble, then chances are it's exceeding its solubility limit right away and forming a precipitate almost instantly. Okay. So those are the substances we're considering that readily precipitate from a solution. So we have a series of rules to tell us if something is soluble. And this is something that you need to know from chapter four, these solubility rules, just some general guidelines. Okay, so I would put a star next to this in your notes in slide 31. Right? Things are soluble if they have a group one metal cation, something like Na plus or K plus, or ammonium, NH4 plus. Okay? Things are also soluble if they have acetate, bicarbonate, nitrate, or chlorate, which hopefully you know those names. If not, they're on your list of polyatomics. Okay? And there are no exceptions to either of those. If you see that in an ionic compound, it's always soluble. Okay. And typically, if you have a halide ion, so something from group 17, Cl minus, Br minus, or sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, these are usually soluble, but there are a couple of exceptions. Okay, so most chlorides are soluble, for example, but lead chloride, PbCl2, is not. Flip side of that, some things are usually almost always insoluble. Okay? So carbonate, chromate, phosphate, sulfide, and hydroxide are typically always insoluble unless they have group one ions in them, ammonium in them, or in the case of hydroxide, barium hydroxide, BA, parentheses, OH, close parentheses, 2, is also soluble. So just some general guidance, things that are typically soluble, typically insoluble. That's going to get you through all the examples that we have to consider in Gen Chem 1. And so let's look at an example of a precipitation reaction. Now, looking at the complete molecular equation here, OK, potassium iodide, that's going to be soluble because it has potassium, a group one ion. Lead nitrate, okay? nitrates are always soluble. Right? So both of these things are always soluble. 
Over here, this is soluble for both of the reasons I just mentioned. Okay, but lead iodide is not, as I just mentioned, right? Halides are soluble unless they're bonded to lead. That's one of the exceptions. So that's why this is a solid, whereas everything else is aqueous. Okay, so lead iodide, PBI2, precipitates from solution. And if you write the net ionic equation, you can clearly see that this is a precipitation reaction. Lead iodide is the precipitate. Aqueous things going to a solid precipitate, that's a precipitation reaction. Here's another one to consider, right? Putting sodium chloride and silver one nitrate together. Okay, well, now I need to think about the possible pairs. Split them up into their cations and their anions, Na plus and Cl minus, Ag plus and NO3 minus. Then put the cations in the anions, switch them. NaNO3, okay, sodium nitrate. That's soluble because it's got a group one ion in nitrate. But if I put AgCl in there, okay, silver chloride, chlorides are typically soluble, but silver is another exception. Okay, so AgCl will form a solid and it will precipitate. Okay, again, consistent with those solubility rules. So when you're in doubt, consider all the possible ion pairs, know your solubility rules, and be able to predict if a precipitate will form. If no precipitate forms, then no reaction happens. So that's our first reaction from this video, a precipitation reaction. Our second is an acid-base reaction. And we've already seen acids in chapter two, we see them again in chapter four, we'll talk about them a little bit later on in the semester. And then in Gen Chem 2, we'll spend a whole chapter talking about acids and bases. Okay. Right now, we just need to know the basic definition of an acid-base reaction. And that's where we take a hydrogen ion, so H plus, hydrogen with a plus one charge, and we transfer it from one chemical species to another. The thing that gives up the H is called an acid. And if you put an acid in water, it generates hydronium. H3O plus, because truly H plus can't exist just on its own. Right? In an aqueous solution, it bonds with water. So H plus and H2O come together, it forms hydronium, H3O plus. Okay. So this shows us how hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, right? It takes its H plus, donates it to water to form H3O plus. And if this was HCl neutral to begin with, then we have Cl minus that's left over. Okay, so that is an acid-base reaction. HCl is the acid, and it might be weird to think about, but water here is actually acting as a base. It takes the H+. This is what that looks like in solution. 100% of that HCl, when it's aqueous, donates, to, donates the proton, the H+, to H2O. Okay, that's different than if HCl were a gas, okay, which we talked about in Chapter 2. But there are cases where I have a strong acid. HCl is one of them. The fact that it dissolves completely and gives up all of its H+, every HCl gives up the H+, when it's aqueous and just leaves behind Cl-, uh, things that completely react like that are called strong acids. And there are seven strong acids that exist that you need to know. We just talked about HCl, hydrochloric acid. That's one of them. And there are six others. And this will be on your test. Okay? You have to know the seven strong acids. Hydrobromic acid, HBr, hydroiodic acid, HI, nitric acid, HNO3, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and then perchloric and chloric acid, HClO4 and HClO3, respectively. Okay? Know their names, know their formulas, be able to identify if something is a strong acid. Because that means it completely donates fully, 100% ionizes, 100% gives up its H+. But there's only seven of them. Right? Weak acids are a lot more common. These things only partially react with water. And if it's not one of the seven strong acids, it's anything else, but it's still an acid, then it's a weak acid. Okay? And that means that most of it stays in its original form, just a little bit donates H+. Okay? So acetic acid is, a little, is an example of this. Right? That's the active thing in vinegar. Put it with water, and some of that proton, this is the acidic one, the H plus, will go to water. But notice the change in the arrow. 
Okay, because only about 1% of that acetic acid does that and gives up its H+. Okay, so I've replaced it with a double arrow. Okay, that tells me that I'm working at an equilibrium. It's a partial reaction. It only goes a little bit from reactants to products. Some of those products come back to reactants. Okay, so that's how weak acids work. Citric acid, another example of a weak acid. But these things are a lot more common. So what are bases? Our basic definition right now of a base is something that dissolves in water to make hydroxide ions. Remember, hydroxide is OH minus. Okay. The most common bases are ionic compounds where you take group one combined with a hydroxide ion. Okay, so here's a couple examples, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, barium hydroxide if we jump into group two lithium hydroxide. Okay. These three right here are the most common strong bases, okay, meaning they completely dissociate in water and they give up 100% of their OH minus, their hydroxide. Okay. And that's how this works, right? It completely dissociates. Sodium hydroxide is acting as a strong base. Okay. But when it breaks up like that, that's actually just a dissociation a physical process, right, breaking apart, not an acid-base reaction, it's just dissociating in water. What is the actual acid-base reaction? Well, here I see it easier with a weak base, okay, because I mentioned before how water was acting as a base by accepting a proton. Here, notice water is actually acting as an acid by donating up H+. And here, ammonia is acting as a weak base. And weak bases right, produce hydroxide by reacting with water. They pull a proton away from water. That's why we saw water acting as an acid, because the other thing is a base, and it makes OH minus that way. So that is our example of an acid-base reaction. Here, ammonia is a base. Okay, NH3 is the base. Water is acting as an acid, okay? which doesn't contradict what we said before. Water can actually act as an acid or a base depending on what's in solution with it. That's okay. So we finish by considering a neutralization reaction. Okay. Neutralization reactions are what we'll most commonly see with acid-base reactions. And that's where we have an acid and a base come together to produce a salt and water. Okay. Now, a salt does not just mean table salt. In this case, we're defining a salt as an ionic compound. So a neutralization reaction, acid-base reaction where reactants are an acid, okay, so here HCl is an acid, a base, magnesium hydroxide is a base, and the products are magnesium chloride, a salt, and water. Okay, but our reactants themselves are not water. Okay, we have an acid and a base that are different from water. Acid and a base go to a salt and water. That's the formula to identifying a neutralization reaction and correctly labeling it as an acid-base reaction. Okay. So that is your second type, major category that you're expected to identify. Precipitation was number one. Here, acid-base is number two, which is why you need to know that HCl is an acid. Okay, magnesium hydroxide, it's got hydroxide. I know that's a base. Making a salt and water, bam, neutralization, piece of cake. So we finish example 4.4 here. I ask you to write the net ionic equation representing the neutralization of any strong acid. Okay, so choose any one of the seven strong acids with a group one hydroxide. So NaOH or KOH would be a good choice there. No matter what you choose in any of those possible combinations, you get the same final answer for the net ionic equation. It's H plus aqueous plus OH minus aqueous forming H2O liquid. So I recommend you pick an example. Try that out for practice. When you write the net ionic equation, that's what you should get for your answer. If you don't, right, then get in contact with me and we can talk about what's going wrong. There are other examples on sapling and in the textbook to solidify your understanding. Okay, but make sure you can identify acid-base reactions and write net ionic equations, as well as precipitation reactions, net ionic equations there too. Okay. Because those are big ideas. What we're going to do next in the second video on section 
is change gears and introduce the third type of reaction, which is known as oxidation reduction or a redox reaction, if you've heard that term before.